Good afternoon and good morning and welcome to this uh, discussion on two of Shelley's most important poems, Ode to the West Wind and to a Skylark. Now, in this particular discussion, we will not only have an analysis of these two texts, we we'll also look at how they articulate the qualities of sublimity in Shelley's poetry, how they articulate the role of the poet in the intellectual horizon of uh, Percy B. Shelley. We'll also take a look at how you know, Shelley's poems sort of are fit within this entire gamut of the Romantic movement. So it is with these uh, sort of projects in mind that I would like to project uh, a, a share Shelley's uh, text so that we can immediately launch into uh, an analysis of the text. Uh, I will hope that this is visible. Right. <clears throat> so, Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Now, Shelley writes this poem in 1820 in Italy, uh, or, or rather 1819 in uh, Italy, in a Cascine wood uh, near Naples. Now, interestingly, what is very important is that this period, 1819-20, is uh, Shelley's most, one of Shelley's most important and fertile periods. And we've discussed already, you know, Shelley writing The Mask of Anarchy, Prometheus Unbound, and The Condition of England, England in 1819. So let me reiterate this, that Shelley sees English society as moribund, exploitative and in need of both reform in terms of legal and parliamentary rights to vote as well as an oppressive society that is continuously sort of denying its citizens the basic rights of food and shelter and therefore you know poem after poem talks about this question of revolution and the ways in which this entire public movement can be channelized and what the role of the poet and the and poetry and literature can be so it is keeping in mind these factors that we need to take a look at the ode to the west wind that shelley is extremely disturbed the peterloo massacre has just happened that shelley is uh, living in Naples and in Liverno with uh, almost uh, in, a, in a condition of being broke. Shelley's, one of Shelley's children, his son has died, his daughter is ill, his relationship with Mary Shelley is breaking down. He's in a state of personal crisis as well as in a state of acute crisis as he sees his beloved English society collapsing. The potential of the French Revolution degenerating into anarchy. And it is with this aim that he composes a series of poems, The Mask of Anarchy, Prometheus Unbound, Ode to the West Wind, uh, also the defense of poesy, poetry. So it is in this state of mind that we need to approach the West Wind. Now, if you remember the mask of the discussion on the mask of anarchy, Shelley had talked about, you know, freedom as being accompanied by three important parameters. One is poetry, the other is science, and the other is ideas and philosophy. So in that sense, Shelley's poetry will also include, you know, the acute observation of scientific phenomenon. And why does Shelley, you know, talk about poetry and what the importance of poetry because poetry sees into the harmony language and poetry sees into the harmony of the chaotic scenes or the chaotic phenomenon and therefore can organize it in a systemic body of ideas that can challenge any form of 
authoritarianism and <coughs> usher in the vision of a new utopia. So it is harmony of language and the power of the poet to grasp that state of harmony and usher in a state of utopia that Shelley sees as <coughs> quintessential. So Shelley's poetry sees a kind of a nexus between a kind of intimate interaction between science and poetry. We've seen this in the cloud poem to the cloud as Shelley writes, where once again, he's acutely observing natural phenomenon and seeing the harmonizing phenomenon of this uh, of, of nature. Similarly, Ode to West Wind also talks about different zones of nature. And let me now launch into the poem so that I can illustrate what I've been trying to make, the point that I'm trying to make. A wild west wind, notice how Shelley's poetry is marked by this ruthless, you know, rather breathless energy of the west wind that cap is captured by that initial alliteration, wild west wind, as it were. So the, the kind of a onomatopoeic alliteration that breezes initiates the gust of power of the west wind. Now, remember, the west wind will always be compared with the easterly winds of spring. The west wind is the wind of autumn. Therefore, the west wind has potential of you know, great force, destruction, and a lot of hailstorm. It's compared to the milder east wind of spring. So wild west wind. And, and you'll have to remember, of course, that staying in India, we are... <coughs> you know, uh, looking at the reverse kind of wind phenomenon that Shelley would have looked at. For Shelley, the west wind is the most tempestuous, right? Whereas the easterly spring winds are far more moderate. So wild west wind, the breathlessness, the, the conveying of the sense of force, the breath of autumn's being, right? So the west wind is, as it were, the breath of autumn's being. Obviously, you can understand the personification here, both west wind and uh, autumn being personified. Thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Once again, notice one thing about Shelley's imagery, the way in which it quickly sort of moves into the realm of the imaginative, fantastic, sublime, right? So, you know, notice the richness there from whose unseen presence, the, the, the presence of the wind is unseen as it were. And that quality of the unseen is going to be an important phenomenon for Shelley. And, you know, once again, the breath of autumn is also equated later on with the breath of the poet. So the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. See, the west wind immediately then becomes the kind of an enchanter from which the ghosts are fleeing. Now, this concept of the ghost is related with the ghosts and the apparitions of totalitarianism, exploitation, that we've already seen in the mask of anarchy where you know anarchy is as it were a skeleton that rampages upon the streets followed by the pageant of hypocrisy murder and fraud so in that sense the west wind has this magic magical quality of transforming and completely banishing these ghosts you will also remember in the mask of anarchy which i've discussed earlier how you know this Specter comes up at the moment when anarchy is at its prime, which defeats anarchy. So it's like magician, the quality of poetry, once again, to conjure up, you know, magical imagination that can articulate ideas of, of poetry and, uh, and great transformation. Yellow and black and pale and hectic red. Now, once again, very important in Shelley's poetry in this case is the particular kind of riot of colors that Shelley uses in the text. Yellow and black and pale and hectic red. 
once again acutely observed the yellowing leaves, the reddish hue within the setting sun and pale pestilence-stricken multitudes. Once again, this line, of course, refers to this diseased multitudes of the leaves, but it also refers in an oblique way to the diseased population of England at this point of time, who are <coughs> then driven into action, as it were, or even the exploiting class who are driven, who are withered and who are driven into destruction. O thou who chariotest to the dark wintry bed, the wingest seeds. So the seeds which drop. Now, you, you will remember, of course, those of you who are doing Keats. Keats's autumn is, autumn old, is an, a time of mist and mellow fruitfulness. If you remember those lines where, you know, it's like, you know, autumn is sitting like this woman with all her hair and the winnowing winds blowing and the ripe fruits are laden with juices. Shelley's autumn, on the other hand, is an autumn of great energy, an autumn that is revolutionary, that is windy, that drives these seeds into the ground <clears throat> where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave. So they are embedded deep into the bowels of the earth, like a corpse is sort of put into its grave. Until thine azure, azure is the brilliant crystalline blue, sister of spring shall blow, so the easterly wind shall blow. And you remember, see, blue, black, yellow, pale, hectic red, you see the kind of riot of colors that Shelley brings from nature within the poem. And what this does is once again add to this sublime quality of the text. The, the poem, as it were, blinds us with color. Thine azure sister of the spring shall blow, a clarion over the dreaming earth. Once again, this, this concept of the clarion call, the, the kind of a trumpet, the kind of a of a resounding cry, clarion cry that Shelley announces, is not only the voice of the West Wind, which seeks to bring revolutionary zeal, but also the poet, because it's at the end of the poem, we'll find that, you know, the poem which begins with natural phenomenon will reverse and turn towards the poet, right? And his clarion call. So her clarion over the dreaming earth and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air with living hues, hues as colors and odors, plain and hill. Once again, you notice the synesthesia that we have observed in Keats, the bringing together of the different senses of odor and hues and color, sight, sound, smell, wild spirit. Once again, notice this concept of the wild, wild west wind and the wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here and here. Now, that's very interesting in the sense that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the west wind is both a wild spirit, and yet that wildness is not merely a destructive influence, but from that wildness will regenerate a creative, so destroyer and preserver. Now, Shelley is introducing here into this particular stanza a kind of a concept which we'll call the paradox of the West Wind. What is the paradox of the West Wind? The paradox of the West Wind is that the West Wind is wild, yet it will generate something which is beautiful and harmonious. The West Wind is destructive, yet it is also going to preserve the ideas and the ideals. How is it going to do so? Is the question that Shelley will put before us. But before we move into uh, the explanation of the paradox, a quick look at the rhyme scheme of the text that Shelley is using. So being fleeing A, B, A. And then you have, once again, B, C, B. Then C, D, C. 
and then you have D, E, D, and then you have E and E. Now, this is called the terza rima. A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E, D, E, E. The concluding couplet. Now, this interlaced rhyme scheme is something that provides a kind of it provides the swirling sense of motion of the west wind and its force. And the concluding couplet, the E E of the stanza, provides, as it were, the clinching argument of the text. So, very importantly, you know, this paradox, wild spirit which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here or oh here, is a line which brings with great force the impact or the symbolic impact of the West Wind. Right. So Shelley has greatly observed this natural phenomenon. The scientific observation is put in a language that is sublime, in a rhythm that mimics or that imitates the motion, the swirling, violent motion of the West Wind. And yet it creates a paradox of ideas of the West Wind as being both the destroyer and the preserver. Now, I'll come to the major idea of the poem in a minute once we've discussed the text. But let me bring this you know, text alive to you first. So the first stanza of the text actually takes place on air, right on the ground, above the ground, as it were. So it takes place within earth. Now, this next stanza, Shelley turns his attention to the impact that the wind has underground, as it were, within the ocean, in water. So Shelley is looking at the, the impact that the west wind is having on the elements, the different elements of air, water, and, you know, the clouds, as it were, and the earth. Thou on whose stream, mid the steep ice commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed. So the focus is on the sky now. From the earth, Shelley has turned to the sky and the havoc that the sky is, you know, witnessing with the coming of the west wind, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. Now, the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean are the clouds, right, which look like gigantic tree branches on the sky. And if you look at these clouds that Shelley is talking about, he's actually observing the clouds uh, on the sky. And angels of rain and lightning, right? So, you know, once again, lightning is and thunder are objects and weapons of God in the classical myth myths. So the lightning and thunder, lightning is seen as the, as the arms of the angels. And once again, with the angels come this concept of, of the divine battle that takes place. And there are references, of course, to fire and lightning and the way in which Prometheus brings fire. Fire in Shelley is always associated with knowledge. Right. So, you know, how interlace these texts are uh, in Shelley's very rich productive year of 18, 19, 20 is something that we need to look at. <clears throat> there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge like the bright hair. And notice once again how Shelley's imagery has this quality of periodically suddenly launching into a sublime mythical sort of quality. You know, what happens is that the quality of the verse suddenly takes a leap into the fabulous imagery which Shelley draws from the classical uh, uh, zones. And you see this cloud which is torn apart and kind of flees across the air. That is compared in the simile like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce menad. Now, the menads were women who accompanied the Bacchic god Dionysus. And Dionysius's uh, you know, companions were these menads 
who were considered to be women who were entering into a state of frenzy and madness. So the West Wind, as it were, sort of impels a kind of a madness within the crowds so that they're lifted like the head, hair on the head of some Meenad. Now, interestingly, this, this, this figure of this possessed woman who's blessed with madness, as it were, is a standard romantic trope. If you remember your Kublai Khan, you will remember this lady with the dulcimer who is, you know, singing frenzied uh, with the quality of inspiration. Now, you will, of course, remember Auerbach's Mimesis, where Auerbach talks about two ways in which, you know, uh, poetry can function. One as representation or mimicking imitation and the other as representation in or, or creating new in a frenzy of activity. And when, you know, Plato talks about this to Ion in, this, in his very celebrated treatise, Ion, he asks Ion, how do you compose? And Ion says, I compose in a frenzy where you know, insp I am inspired. So the figure of the Meenad, the figure of this damsel with a dulcimer, this figure of the frenzied woman in uh, a, a rich blast of composition is something that the romantic poet draws as the inspired poet, the figure of the inspired poet, the creative artist who, who functions when there is tremendous inspiration. Right. So, you see how we will, you know, continuously weld these elements. We've already seen a paradox of the destroyer and the preserver. We're seeing this image of the fierce Minad, and it will be my effort in this discussion to link these up together, to see how these different elements function together. After fierce Minad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm. Now, once again, let me ask you to compare Shelley's autumn, autumnal wind with Keats's autumnal wind. And Keats's autumnal wind is a gentle breeze that blows. It's filled with fulfillment. It's, it's sort of, it's a poem of acceptance of the cycle of life and death. And it is the acceptance of the poet within this grand cycle. Shelley's autumnal wind is not a wind of acceptance. It's a wind which sort of destroys. It's a wind which brings great tumult and recreates something. So it's very interesting to see how you know Shelley and Keats, who are by now both in Italy and who are almost composing together, look at the same natural phenomenon in very different perspectives. The dirge of the dying year. So obviously the wind is also the dirge, the song once again. This element of the song comes back. This melancholic song of the dark, dying year, the year which is dying because winter is coming. To which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulcher. Sepulcher is once again the tomb. So we have once again the images of the grave and the tomb, you know, images of a dying state, images of a dying country, right, which is, which is on the verge of collapse, which is on the verge of, of, of death, of obliteration, vaulted with all thy congregated might of vapors, from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail with burst appear. Once again, that you know, the west wind and the Terza Rima in this in, in this entire stanza talks about the climactic moment when there will be great hail and storm and rain. You know, so you know the clouds have gathered and there will be rain, and the rain will be something which will be the storm will be something which will destroy, and the rain will be something which will create. So once again, this paradox of the destroyer and the creator 
is a paradox that Shelley returns to time and again. Thou who didst waken. And now, so the first stanza, earth and the observed phenomenon of the earth. The second stanza, the sky and the you know, tumult that the west wind causes among the clouds. And then the third stanza, where Shelley returns to the water. So it's incredible, isn't it, that Shelley, the, the poet, whom we know as a revolutionary, whom we know as abstract, whom uh, sort of Arnold sort of dismisses almost as this, you know, golden angel with his angel, with his ineffectual angel, with his golden wings beating in vain, is also at the same time a very acute observer of natural phenomena. Remember, we discussed in Shelley's Life and Times how closely he was associated with the chemists and the scientists and how he loved his time in the laboratory. So the acute observation of natural detail and the kind of natural cycles that took place is something that works its way into his poetry. So thou who didst wake us from his summer dreams, now comes the third stanza where he'll observe, you know, the phenomenon underwater. Thou who dost wake us from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean, and Shelley is obviously at Naples at this point of time, looking at the sea, the blue crystalline sea with the underwater vegetation also seen. You know, it's a transparent, brilliant blue sea, right? Who's where he lay lulled by the coil of the crystalline streams. So the Mediterranean is as it were sleeping after spring and summer. Beside a pumice isle in Bayes Bay. Now Bayes Bay is the place where Shelley actually visited in Naples. And it's famous principally because... At Bayes Bay, under the crystalline waters, you could actually see the ruins of the Roman civilization. So the Roman ruins were, as it were, visible at Bayes Bay and saw in sleep. So the Mediterranean, as it were, is sleeping. And in, in her sleep, it's dreaming of the old palaces and the towers quivering with the waves in tense a day. So Shelley is not making something up. These palaces are not archaic palaces. These are real palaces which were ruined and which lay under the water, all overgrown with azure moss. Once again, notice the right of color. Azure is a color that is coming back over and over again. Azure moss and flowers, so sweet, the saints faints picturing them. Thou, and then comes the west wind. You see, with that exclamation mark so far there was sleep so far there was rest so far there was peace and then the west wind comes in with all its violence and its gusto thou for whose path the atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms so the kind of turmoil that took place on the earth the turmoil that took place in the sky is replicating itself in the turmoil that takes place underwater. So cleave them into chasms. So they're sort of, it's a kind of a tsunami happening underneath the water. You know, the, 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 the waters are coiling into chasms and waves, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods. The sea blooms, the underwater vegetation and the oozy woods. So the underwater forest, as it were, which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean. And you see how acute Shelley's observation is about the underground, underwater foliage that is not disturbed until this storm passes within the sea. Know thy voice. So suddenly this state of stasis of the moss-grown vegetation, of the decaying ruins, suddenly grow trim gray with fear, suddenly become afraid. Now, is this static, underwater, moss-grown, ruined uh, sort of artifacts suggestive of the state of England 
which has similarly grown mossy, undergrow, you know, static and ruined. So is this once again Shelley's poem, England in 1819, the poem which I'm repeatedly asking you to take a look at? Is this the ruined state of England to which the West Wind must bring a kind of vigor and sort of create unrest and completely revolutionize and tremble and despoil themselves over here. Right. So once again, the West Wind is actually bringing in a state of un turmoil, unrest, fear, destruction. And yet it is also heralding a kind of a new order, a new preservation. So is the West Wind, as we see in the three stanzas of the Terza Rima and the concluding couplet, the West Wind is marked by this intense energy, the sublime force which can move a static earth, air and water into great turmoil. Now, so far, within the three stanzas of the Terza Rima, the interlist rhyme pattern, the concluding couplet has created this atmosphere of great vigor, wind, turmoil, and potential change. It has generated a sense of sublime awe, fear. And remember when we discussed the question of romantic sublimity, we considered this question of the romantic poet creating this atmosphere of fear and awe so that there's a heightened state of human emotions. Peri hypsos, hype is sublimity. Now, so far he has described the west wind and its impact, the way it, the west wind can move the natural phenomenon. But as it happens with the romantic poet time and time again, be it Wordsworth, be it Keats, be it Coleridge, be it Shelley. The romantic poet is obsessed with his subjective self. And therefore, external nature is at some point of time or the other internalized within the subjectivity of the poet only. We've seen this in the egotistical sublime of Wordsworth, where this ruins of the Tintern Abbey become alive because they are internalized by the poet. And these ruins then become a way, a gateway for entering into the subjective consciousness of the romantic poet. So the romantic poet, as it were, sublimates nature, as Shelley does, creates awe and splendor and fear, and then internalizes the nature so that his own state of turmoil and his own schema of ideas can then be expressed through the natural phenomenon. So if the first two stanzas of the West Wind are about the West Wind and its you know, paradox of being the preserver and the destroyer and the mover and shaker within the sky and the earth and the water, then the fifth, fourth and the fifth stanzas of the West Wind suddenly reverse the direction and internalize the West Wind to express the subjective con consciousness of the poet person. So next you see, so far we haven't had the personal pronoun I. All was thou. So it was thou, right? So take a look at this. He begins almost every single stanza with the pronoun thou. Now comes, you see, once again, see, this is thou. This is thou. This is thou. But if you take a look at the fourth stanza, then the direction has suddenly changed. The wind is now internalized. And the personal pronoun 
is the first person pronoun I. So if I were a dead, dead leaf, thou mightest hear. So it's no longer thou in terms of thou only. It's not the west wind for the west wind's sake. It's the west wind now for the poet's sake. The thou for the I. You know, it's this dialectical interplay between the I and the thou which becomes so very crucial in the operative phenomenon of romanticism itself. It's not just merely sort of, sort of located in Shelley only. So if I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud, so it's just talking about the different phenomenon underground, on, in the sky, on the earth, a wave to pant beneath thy power and share. So you see, in these three lines, Shelley has actually brought the earth, the sky, and the water. So if I were a leaf, you could have moved me. If I were a cloud, I could have flied with thee. If I were a wave, I would have panted with thee. The impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, O uncontrollable. Now, Shelley is contrasting his, the uncontrollability, the wildness of the West Wind, with his limited, timid self. Right. And then he talks about his limitless self. If even if I were as in my boyhood and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven. So he talks about his youth and his childhood where he was uncontrollable and free. But now he's been sort of circumscribed by life, sort of created a boundary here. Life has created a boundary, compulsions under him, under which he functions. The comrade scarce in the vision. I would never have striven as thus with thee in prayer with my sore need. Now, Shelley is for, for the point of time now bringing in the west wind because of his sore need. So the west wind was never important in itself. The west wind was important because the poet needed it in its sore, in his sore need. So the wind now becomes a vehicle for the poet at a given place and time. Oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. Again, the three stanzas coming together in that one line. I fall upon the thorns of life. I bleed. A heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Now, this is a very important segment of the poem, which demands our attention in considerable detail. Now, Shelley is talking about his personal sorrow, his personal grief. You know, you will remember that Shelley was atheist. Shelley was a man who believed in free sexuality and sort of contested the idea of marriage. Shelley was the one who was perpetually looking for freedom, liberty, be it for the Irish or the English or for reform in general of mankind. So yet at this point of time, Shelley was tied down with debtors breathing down his neck. He'd been forced to exile himself in Italy. As I said, his relationship with Mary Shelley was breaking down. His infant son had died. His daughter was tottering on the verge of death. So all in all, Shelley was facing a fundamental personal crisis. At the same time, Shelley was intensely, you know, as it were, had this element of the nerves. So he was intensely marked by sensibility, right? So unlike and, and very frequently suffered from, you know, nervous disorders like delusions. So once again, Shelley fits into this prototype of the romantic poet who is marked by a greater sensibility, a greater you know, degree of emotions 
a greater visionary feeling power. So in that sense, when he talks about I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. He's also talking about his own personal crisis. At the same time, this I in the poem might also be the collective I of England and Europe, as it were, because the French Revolution had taken place and failed. Because England, the England of Shelley was being ruled by a king and the period of regency and the trio of Castlereagh, who was ruthlessly, you know, the, the, the entire state machinery of, uh, of England was ruthlessly oppressing its own people, including the Irish, betraying the Irish after having promised them the act of union. So all in all, this I might be the personal Shelley. It might also equally be the English Shelley. It might also be the European selfhood, which was thrown into a moment of crisis and was therefore crying out for direction and change. You know, Europe at this point of time was one which did not offer adult franchisee. It did not, it, its system of governance was marked by class privileges and power was concentrated in a few hands, marked by tyranny. Therefore, Shelley, this figure of the eye might be the personal crisis, might be the political crisis in England, might equally be this concept of the defeat of the European self. And therefore, Shelley is, is compositely feeling this sense of tremendous crisis and anxiety within the poetic self, which is far more sensitive and marked by this intense nervousness. So asking the, the, the West Wind to add its force, because he himself at this point of time is, you know, in a state of weakness. I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed, a heavy weight of ours. So this heavy weight might be his personal crisis, might be the weight of the tyrannical and non-reformist government of England, might equally being the tyrannical Europe where the French Revolution had just faded. Right. So a heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed one too like thee. And the poet defines himself, his ideal utopian self, tameless and swift and proud. Now, the very important word there, of course, is stainless, free. Now, and we've seen how Shelley sort of, uh, sort of repeatedly talks about the notion of freedom in his poems and his belief in the idea of liberty. Make me thy liar. Once again, you see, what happens is that the poet has internalized the West Wind. So it's no longer thou. You make me thy liar. But the important word is me. And the lyre is that musical instrument which plays once the wind flows through it, right? So the west wind now becomes the impetus, the inspiration that will motivate the poet to sing. Even as the forest is, what if my leaves are falling like its own? So he realizes that death is at his shoulder, suffering is at his shoulder. You will also see how, you know, Repeatedly, Keats talks about the fever and the fret and the palsy that is on his doorsteps and the shadow of impending death that he will talk about. So the sensitive poet who feels his failures, yet who seeks to sing and who seeks to create this sublime utopia of potential freedom, the tumult of thy mighty harmonies, will take from both a deep autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Now, that's another very important phenomenon that the romantics uh, draw upon, be it Wordsworth, Keats or Shelley once again, that the experience of life and its tyrannies, 
provide a wisdom to the romantic poet. So much as we may see the romantic poet as naive, the romantic poet is tempered by life. And Shelley uh, Wordsworth, if you remember in Tintern Abbey, his, you know, his still sad music of humanity can be heard only after his ideals have collapsed. His love with Annette Vallon has collapsed. Shelley's great autumnal loads can come only and only after you had the palsy shaking a few sad last gray hairs in the nightingale ode. And in Shelley too, the suffering has produced within him a deeper wisdom about the nature of man. And therefore, the tone, the poetry that he writes now is a maturer poetry, sweet though in sadness. Later on, when we read the Skylark poem, we will see how Shelley's poetry is marked by his recognition that our sweetest songs are those that sing of saddest thought. Be thou spirit fears my spirit. So because my spirit is bowed down, because I'm chained down, let your spirit enter into mine. So it's a kind of a transposition. It's a kind of a transference of the West Wind, the internalization of the West Wind <coughs> within the romantic poet. And then comes that climactic moment when the object West Wind and the subjective poet, that distance is erased and they become one and the other. Be thou me, impetuous one. So he now wants to become the figure of impetuousness, freedom, force, and then recreate that on the universe. And then comes this very important idea. What is the role of the poet and poetry? Why does Shelley want the West Wind to become me, impetuous one? He says, drive my dead thoughts over the universe. So, you see, this is where the West Wind is the destroyer and the preserver. That the thoughts that are within the poet, who is collapsing under the burdens, and therefore somebody who can no longer have the power to sort of circulate his ideas, seeking inspiration from the West Wind, so that his dead thoughts may be spread over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. So on the ruins of an old England and Europe, Shelley seeks, like this prophetic poet, to circulate his ideas so that they may generate, regenerate an England that will challenge, rise up to challenge tyranny. So from the bowels of defeat and anarchy will creep up this specter that we have already seen that will create a new dawn of hope and freedom. And therefore, you know, will provoke, as we've seen, like the people from lions in a slumber and will shake the freedom uh, or shake the slavery like the dew from the grass. I like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And by the incantation of this verse, once again, Compare this with the image of the Minad, these, you know, frenzied singing women, right? Similarly, the poet is this frenzied singing soul, incantation, this kind of a repeated uh, lyrical form, scatter as from an unextinguished heart, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, be through my lips, to an unawakened earth, an earth that is sleeping, an earth that is enslaved, be the words of freedom to create that specter which will defeat anarchy and bring hope, the triumph of a prophecy. Right? Once again, you see, this is the moment when the objective distance between the West Wind and the subjective poet is obliterated. And the West Wind becomes the spirit of inspiration and imagination, which will then provoke the poet, prophet figure to rise. And Shelley, 
will bring in this idea in the figure of the poet as the unacknowledged legislator of the world, a prophetic figure who can sort of speak power, truth to power and bring in a new dawn or wind. So if I, the prophet, can have your energy. So at the end of the day, it's not about the West Wind at all, this poem. It is about the poet reasserting his agency and his force again and again, time and again, so that his words may hit society with a prophetic force and revolutionize it and bring, as it, the poet says, oh wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. So this is the paradox answered that the west wind brings the seeds to the grave and from that grave rises up new thoughts. The poet, when he's inspired, scatters these seeds of thought within the earth from which new revolutions can occur and freedom might be generated. Let me remind you once again of our discussion on the mask of anarchy. What does poet Shelley want? Shelley suggests that this poem will provoke the people to gather in one assembly beneath the wide sky of all classes so that together they may create a society that is juster, more free, and that can sort of distribute its resources evenly. And a society which will not be faced by violence of the state, but a society that will come with nonviolence and will defeat and shame the attacker and create a state that will be marked by peace, love, wisdom, food, science, poetry, and ideas. So once again, Shelley is coming back to that idea. Shelley is returning to that idea that he's articulating time and time again in the defense of poetry. Now, uh, let, me, let me come back once again. And I see that there are a few questions in the chat box, which I'll come to in a little, little moment. But this is what Shelley has to say. Now, you have to understand this very clearly, that poets are not the authors of language and music. They are the instructors of laws, the founders of civil society. So for Shelley, you see, the poet figure is important because he only has the power to recognize within the chaos the potential for harmony. And therefore, social and linguistic order are not the sole products of rational faculty. As language is arbitrarily produced by the imagination and reveals the before unapprehended relations of things and perpetuates their apprehension of a higher beauty and truth. You see, Shelley is suggesting that rationality can only explain certain phenomenon as they are and organize them into observable phenomena. But it is only the poet which can see beyond the rational and create a harmony through his language, create a vision that produces the potential of an alternative sublime world. So if we take a look at the earlier lectures on the mask of anarchy, we shall see that Shelley sees the Peterloo massacre as the moment when all hell breaks loose on England and that people are murdered and violently brought together on the, on the footsteps of anarchy, as it were, where there's no right of the common man, where food security has disappeared. But it is the poet who can then conjure up this vision which will defeat anarchy and then articulate what and how freedom can be achieved through nonviolent protest, through the organization of the people and shaming of the perpetrators of violence. He can look into 
a potential new order. Now, obviously, many of you will feel that this is just, you know, a kind of a sort of like Matthew Arnold, ineffectual. This is an utopia that will never be realized. But when we look at the afterlife of the poem that I discussed yesterday, we'll see how that idea of Shelley of organized nonviolence finds its way across history to Gandhi, to Mandela, to Martin Luther King, and becomes a force that will generate an utopian possibility of a society that is juster, of a freedom that is more viable. It is therefore, you see, the poet's ability not only to create through language a harmonious vision, but a utopian vision of potential freedom that Shelley sees the poet as the unacknowledged legislators of the world and suggests the profound ambiguity inherent in linguistic means, which he considers at once an instrument of intellectual freedom and a vehicle for political and social subjugation. So it is thus, therefore, that the West Wind needs not only to be read as one off poem of Shelley, but a poem that needs to be discussed in terms of a trio of poems, including Prometheus Unbound, the potential of bringing fire to man, defying the words of Zeus, and Zeus here is absolute authority. So the concept of Prometheus is bringing fire to man, the fire of freedom and rationality. The mask of anarchy, where the specter and the vision of a free society can defeat anarchy. And the West Wind, where Shelley sees the figure of this prophetic poet, who can, with his energetic and harmonious self, see into the life of things and create this potential utopian vision of freedom that then he can radiate into the world. So in the moment of great death, in the moment of great crisis that England is faced, Shelley sees a potential also for a great revolution, a great transformation, a sublime transformation of society. And it is in, therefore, you see, that the poet, the poem which started with images of death and fear, ends with an image of sublime hope. Now, con contrast it with Keats. Keats's poem ends with sublime acceptance of the cycle of life and death. But Shelley's poem is revolutionary because it initiates and it resonates with this desire of transformation of society. It sees the West Wind as an agent of change, which will lead to the death of a world order and the establishment of an alternative world order. It is here, therefore, that the West Wind should be read in tandem with not only these two poems, but the articulation of the defense of poetry and the role of the poet in recognizing this harmonious utopian possibility and acting as the poet who is also a prophet. Now let me quickly take a look at, uh, I will stop sharing the screen. Now, I initially had the idea of, uh, of probably sort of doing the Skylark poem two together in this one discussion, but I can see I've already crossed an almost an hour. So what I'll do here is uh, reserve the discussion of the Skylark poem for my next class and try and answer some of the questions that have ra been raised. Now, Ranjun Bormon here asks me, uh, the explanation of the dying year to this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulcher vaulted with all the congregated mind might. So you see, the point is that, you know, the, the dark night, as it were, becomes the west wind sort of draws the agents of destruction all and locks it within this grave, this sepulcher, as it were, where, you know, the the root, the, the, all the material, all the winged seeds will be sort of grafted into the ground. And then from these, these seeds will 
come. So the, the entire sky becomes the dome of this sepulcher, this grave, right? But at one point of time from these dead thoughts that are now, you know, are now sort of deeply grafted within the earth, will be vaulted with a congregated mind, will explode into being. So Shelley sees the ideas, even if they are redundant at one point of time, even if the poet is emasculated at one point of time, at <coughs> some point of time or the other, these ideas will be scattered and these ideas will create a profound transformative change in the world. If you listen to our lectures on uh, the mask of anarchy, it's one text which I ask you to go back to uh, our discussions, you will see how uh, and the afterlife, the final lecture on the mask of anarchy, Shelley's idea about passive nonviolence resistance, how it's an idea that seems to immediately be worth nothing, as Matthew Arnold says, ineffectual angel beating his golden wings in vain. Yet, when its time comes, this idea is once again utilized by Gandhiji. It is used by uh, sort of Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela so that it sort of then explodes with its grandest might. Right. The, uh, the, I've, I've been asked by gender people uh, what, why he uses the run-on line here. Now, the run-on line, of course, and the interlaced terza rima provides the whooshing, the kind of almost breathless motion of the West Wind. And the kind of a, the terza rima with its interlaced pattern mimics this swirling kind of a motion of the West Wind, which comes, as it were, like a gale, like a typhoon almost. So it's interlaced run-on lines are effective. And the terza rima is chosen by Shelley deliberately to mimic this action or this force of the West Wind, which he will subsequently internalize to show the disturbance within the mind of the poet. Now, uh, of course, the West Wind, uh, Shelley will bring in, Shelley does not you know, negate the East Wind. Uh, the North Wind is, of course, the wind of winter. The East Wind he refers to, the sister, as it were, which will bring life and which will regenerate life. But the west wind is the one which he praises because the west wind will drive the maturer seeds into the earth. So the west wind is, in effect, a wind of great disturbance and maturity. Right. So Shelley is, as it were, suggesting that the poetic self can only create a... a a significant amount of ideas only when it matures through suffering. So, you know, as it were, if you take a look at it very carefully, Shelley is looking at a revolution, but he's already seen the collapse of the French Revolution. So the next revolution that he's looking at is not going to be violence met with counter violence. Right. Therefore, the West Wind is the wind of a maturer time of, of autumn, as it were, right? And if you consider autumn as, as a season of maturity, then the west wind brings in not only the urge of a younger revolution, but an urge of a more maturer vision of the revolutionary process, so that the seeds and the ideas which have been tempered with suffering can be grafted into the earth and then can rise once again so that a more viable revolutionary prophetic voice can be heard. Well, I will not talk about the uh, arrival of the West Wind in West Bengal. So uh, that is a, a question that I would not like to bring into an academic class. Uh, uh, that might be the subject of speculation, which uh, you can sort of leave for yourself. Anyways, thank you for your questions. And I hope that uh, this discussion on the West Wind has provided you with a better analysis of the text and a more uh, sort of 
uh, nuanced understanding of how you know ideas themes and technique operate within shelley please remember that shelley is a poet who is extremely technically accomplished we often forget uh, we saw a see of this dreaming revolutionary shelley but shelley is a poet who brings in scientific observation who can bring in the different elements and who can bring in an extreme technical complexity to the poem to articulate his particular ideas now thank you for having uh, sort of listened to this lecture having participated in it with questions uh, let me uh, let me just uh, apologize because i could not complete the skylark poem or discuss the skylark poem at all but i think uh, well west wind probably deserved one entire class and it is with this that i would like to bring this uh, presentation to an end so that you know we can look forward after the breathlessness of the west wind to the sweeter and the more celestial song of the skylark thank you once again and hope all of you have a very good day